We'll wait till it goes live. I'm going to go ahead and share it to our page. Okay. So. There it is. Okay. I see the little live thing. It's populating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Stephen Evans. I am the publisher and editor in chief of OutClick Magazine. Uh, we hope everyone is doing well during this quarantine time. Uh, it is a very difficult time for everyone, for our country and for our world. And uh, we are wishing the best for everyone right now. Uh, today we are uh, talking with um, Nathan Earle, who is the chairperson and director of strategic initiatives for the Arc of Freedom Alliance. Uh, Nathan, if you wanna tell us a little bit about yourself um, and about the Arc of Freedom Alliance to get us started, please. Sure, absolutely. First, let me thank you for for the opportunity. These are um, these are unprecedented times, and uh, we just we really thank you for the for keeping us connected, Stephen. This is this is really important, and it's, it's valuable to the community. So, as you mentioned, my name is Nathan Earl. I my role is the uh, chairman and the um, director of strategic initiatives for Arc of Freedom Alliance. We are a five hundred one c three social justice organization um, based here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Our mission is to prevent the violence and exploitation, human trafficking of children and adults across the lifespan. Uh, we do that by or utilizing a collective health, public health, or public health impact approach um, to co-create more equitable and inclusive systems, uh, better equipped to identify uh, victims across the gender spectrum. Uh, we do. Um, we are heavily involved with community mobilization and the uh, coordinated delivery of prevention, education, intervention, and restorative care. We are led by a diverse board of directors across the gender and racial spectrum, but we also are, um, but we also have board directors who are ex-offenders, recovering addicts, sex workers, or former sex workers, and human trafficking survivors. So we truly are an organization of the people. Our wow. services, um, we do, we, um, we kind of pride ourselves on. There's, there's so many, um, times and you know with with programs that we have well-intentioned people and a lot of programs that do really impactful work but we truly believe um, in ensuring equity if we are developing programs to empower uh, members of a community all of those members of the community who are potentially infected by the epidemic by human trafficking need to be at the table and so that's uh, one of the things that we we pride ourselves in um, for four service pillars, we uh, we offer professional training around human trafficking to service providers, parents, teachers, youth, um, law enforcement, uh, prosecutors, um, anyone who's engaging with these at risk uh, at, at risk youth. We offer uh, we facilitate and coordinate the facilitation of an evidence informed LGBTQI inclusive prevention education curriculum. It was designed and tested for 12 to 18 year old high risk youth. Um, and that, so basically it educates young people on what exploitation, human trafficking indicators and grooming are in a language that a young person understands. Uh, we firmly believe that we are not going to um, approach a young person and say, you're a victim. Uh, we did uh, studies and research uh, more strongly support educating a young person on the dangers of risky behaviors and holding space with that person, that young person um, until a point for where they for themselves believe that they may have been taken advantage of. And so that's what that prevention education curriculum aims to do. It's a whole system approach. So not only are we um, facilitating the curriculum to young people at risk, there's also a comparable uh, curriculum specifically designed for caregivers and parents around the same subject matter, as well as entire school system staff. So anyone on a school, uh, school property or school campus who might engage with a young person will have been trained on indicators and how to support um, a person who, who may have been victimized. In addition to that, we um, are heavily involved with outreach and care coordination. So we engage with higher risk communities, um, communities who've been marginalized by you know, historically underserved um, communities and um, empower them with, with knowledge, education, um, and linkage and service to, to, uh, to community programs. Finally, our direct service program is specifically and specialized for a young adult, male, and LGBTQI survivors of human trafficking and sexualized violence that are also challenged with a substance use disorder. And so uh, collaboration is in our DNA. Um, it's a collective impact, a tenet of collective impact. So we provide the expertise around human trafficking and the trauma resolution 
and we partner with already existing service providers, uh, sober homes, treatment facilities, to um, to to complete a full spectrum of services specifically for that population. Okay, wow. Well, so your outreach is both to service providers and to uh, youth. Um, so, yes, it's into, so it's it's a whole system approach. So it's specifically specialized, curated um, outreach to. Um, to marginalized populations. Our primary focus are, from a gender-based perspective, it's um, male, so um, male victims of sexualized violence, that could be um, black, brown, persons of color, um, but as well as transgender youth and those identifying as, as um, lesbian, gay, bisexual, queer questioning. We also uh, concurrently um, have a specialized um, outreach program for the service providers for law enforcement, for anyone in the community that might be engaging with the young people. Mm -hmm. We train them specifically mm -hmm. on an accurate narrative. What is human trafficking? What's exploitation? What is it not? And our, our the goal of those programmings really is to empower young people, empower parents, empower the community um, to increase uh, increase and build the resilience of our, our community across, across the spectrum. Okay. And then, um Maybe talk a little bit about your personal experience, if you'd like to uh, uh, share that experience with our viewers. Sure, absolutely. I think it's really powerful. I was, um, as a, we know that, well, as a child, I was, I was sexually abused, ritually abused. Um, I was exposed to pornography as uh, for a pornographic conversion therapy when I started showing signs of, of homosexuality as a kid, mm -hmm. um, hypersexualized as a young age. Um, and so that those uh, those those experiences um, led to more risky behaviors. I had a lot of unprocessed trauma when I got out of high school, and I kind of imploded. I was actually um, one of the things that worked for me when I was thirteen and fourteen. You know, I knew if I could get into college, I could escape my situation as a as a child that toxic family of origin. And we know that for many of our youth, that access to education um, is something that they'll latch onto, and it's proven successful, and that worked for me. I was actually uh, in, admitted to the University of Florida right out of college on a pre-medicine scholarship. Um, the, pro the problem with that is I had so many years of unprocessed trauma and drugs for me as a child and as a young person proved a, a successful coping mechanism, not a healthy one, but it allowed me to get through life and I just kept pushing things down and down and down. So um, I, I, I flunked out of college about a year and a half after that, ended up on the streets and started engaging in sex work as a, as a means of survival. Um, I needed a place to stay. And if I could uh, turn a trick or um, you know get a client, I would get off the streets. And every night I was off the streets uh, meant that it was less chances for me to get arrested, less chances for me to get uh, sexually assaulted or raped, less chances of me to get um, you know, beat down. Um, so I, I was strung out on the streets as, you know, 18 or 19, 20, 21, and I engaged or met with, met a drug dealer who um, kind of, he showed me affection and attention. It was in the, you know, the, the, the nightclub scene. And initially it met, it met those needs. I was off the streets. I was safe. I had a drug habit that um, uh, those needs were being met. And it was a grooming process that I know now. Um, he was grooming me. And then uh, before long, it turned really violent and I was pimped out around the drug circle. Um, for about six months, I um, was able to. Uh, one of the things we know, I was I, I was scrappy. I was really scrappy, so I was always fighting. And what we know about these young people and um, you know um, traffickers and the young people that they exploit, there's a there's a phase where they um, or a stage where they phase out, where they're too hard to handle, um, where they're too strung out, where they have um, such a degree of psychosis that they're really not attractive as a commodity. And I know that sounds bad, but that's how that's how it is. So I was back on the streets. I wasn't being trafficked, but I was stuck in a cycle. Uh, by that time, um, severe psychosis from drugs. Um, I can't honestly don't remember how many times I was sexually assaulted or raped on the streets, in and out of jail, um, homeless, experiencing homelessness, no, no stable job supports. And back then, there were even less programs for male victims of sexualized violence than there are now. Um, and so that was, that was my time on the streets for until about 29, 29 years old. I was in a department of corrections. Um, I was in jail and in a jail rehab. And one of the counselors, Mr. Tony Hamer, um, knew my, I, one of the things that I didn't remember or mention before was that, it, that abuse as a child happened in a Christian home. My, mm. my caregivers were missionaries. Um, and so I was not only being abused by those caregivers, but it was a super right-wing, fundamental, crazy conservative um, faith 
where gay people, fags, were, this is what I was taught, were, were going to burn, literally burn. And so that's what I thought as a kid. So this counselor knew that history and knew that the traditional modalities and spirituality probably wasn't going to work. So he exposed me to the teachings of Viktor Frankl. Um, Viktor Frankl was a Holocaust survivor. He's the author of Man's Search for Meaning and developed a logotherapy, which many believe to be the, a, a third school of thought. It basically tells us that humans are driven um, by a purpose, by finding their purpose in even the twisted of circumstances. And I remember, I'll always remember the saying that he, uh, from Viktor Frankl, that he paraphrased that day was, Nathan, if there's meaning in the good things in life, there has to be some type of meaning in the bad things. Hmm. And as, as shot out as I was as a kid, or, you know, as a 29-year-old, still uh, developmentally a kid, um, that, that kind of stuck in my mind, that maybe there was a reason for all of that. And that was the beginning, I think, from uh, that transition from, from that victim to a survivor. Um, let me be very clear, it was not an overnight recovery. Um, you can imagine, one can imagine that, you know, years of poly-victimization, um, and we know this from our, for, from our children and, and youth victims, it's a lifelong process. So those, you know, from my 30s were really were really spent on kind of coming up, um, finding myself a lot of therapy, um, and some of those components of the victimization, the the addiction, and the mental health have been lifelong challenges. Um, today, I'm a person in recovery, a former IV drug user, um, and I live with the mental health challenge. But through um, hard work, staying the course, um, not giving up. Um, and not listening to naysayers and cynics and believing just one little bit that that I had a purpose on the planet, um, I've been able to one day at a time recover. Um, those experiences actually led uh, led me to the founding of the initial Arc of Freedom about six years ago. It was initially founded for a as a safe home for boys for for male victims um, that evolved more more so into a um, into an awareness project. As a survivor and a survivor led organization, we. Our, our proficiency was street-based outreach. We knew how to engage with hard, hard to reach populations. Um, we knew their story. We weren't trying to judge. And so our, our initial thinking was we would, um, we would identify um, potential victims and survivors and then refer to already existing programs. And this was six years ago. What we quickly found out and what we kind of knew but didn't have any evidence to support that services Specialized services for male victims of human trafficking, as well as our LGBTQI survivors, were, were nearly non-existent. Hmm. We had supportive programs for, for, for these two populations, but specific training on how to identify and support a victim of human trafficking, which is a very specific type of trauma that requires a specific type of, of trauma resolution, we just didn't have it. And so we took a year off um, to regroup, um, restructure, see what do we need to do to, to make more of an impact. And to, in 2018, we came back and restructured to what we are today, which is Arc of Freedom Alliance, which is a collective impact, um, a public health oriented collective impact. So what does that mean? It means that we approach human trafficking as a form of violence and as a form of violence, it's a pandemic. It's a it's an it's an epidemic. Um, from a public health perspective, we we kind of pivot our focus away from ending demand and demand reduction and going after the pimps and the johns and all of that to really pivoting our focus to empowering the supply. So if we know that substance use and the history of child abuse, um, homelessness, um, transphobia, homophobia, if those vulnerabilities lead to a moment of victimization, if those things lead to human trafficking. Would it not make more sense to divert most of our resources then to um, collaborating with partners who focus on those things to prevent the crime from happening in the first place? And so that's our model today. We partner with best uh, gold standard organizations such as Flight Center, the Children's Services Council. Um, we've referred to SunServe. We know Trans Inclusive is, a, is an amazing organization. Pride Center does amazing work in the community. These are all organizations that we um, welcome collaboration with and support as a means of preventing victimization. Mm. The reality is that there's a significant prevalence of the trafficking of male and LGBTQI young people here in Broward County. And so while we collaborate to empower youth before victimization, we have a uh, best practice program for survivors once they have been victimized. And that leads us, um, that those are the programs that I was mentioning before.
Okay. okay. We've, We've got, got several people watching. I want to mention if uh, anyone have questions, uh, they're free to ask them in the chat and uh, we'll be maybe addressing some questions that people have for you. So, Absolutely. Um, but yeah, if you want to speak on the underrepresentation of the numbers of that, uh, if you want to elaborate on some of that. Sure, absolutely. You know, if you asked if you asked someone on the street or you know in mainstream discourse, you know, if you mentioned human trafficking, many today would automatically um, say, "Oh, human trafficking, it's connection." Human trafficking equates to the sex trafficking of a female, um, and that happens a lot. Um, women are are trafficked for sex and and labor, mm -hmm. but what an accurate narrative of, and there's a dearth of knowledge and and research based on sound methodology that supports. Um, that as many, depending on region, as many as half of all sex tra uh, uh, child sex trafficking victims will identify as male. Mm -hmm. So within that gender perspective, we know that because of the lack of resources, the lack of programming, constructs around male victimization and homophobia, that this is not something that boys or male youth will like will, are, are ready to disclose. It's a hard, it's something hard. Um, it's challenging to for anyone to disclose that. But there's an added vulnerability, an added challenge within American culture uh, around uh, a boy, a guy being victimized. They're going to think, well, I'm a fag. And this is, these are words that we hear from the youth. And I'm mm -hmm. using that word intentionally is because it's that homophobic language that serves as a coercive mechanism and a fear mechanism to these young, to these young people. The same with our trans youth. Um, so because of those things, it, it's, it's already underreported um, there because of the narrative in, in mainstream society that that it doesn't happen to boys. Um, there's the lack of research. Mm -hmm. That research is primarily what funds programs. So because of all of these those things working together, um, there's a lack of training and awareness from service providers, um, not all service providers. We're working hard and we have some some really impactful providers here. But mm -hmm. by and large. Um, there's a gap in awareness. So we know that, you know, male youth and LGBTQI youth are engaging with, with service providers for on homelessness, substance use, mental health, and all of these other vulnerabilities. Um, what's lacking is specialized training for those providers that make the connection that if this young person is acting out, if the 15 year old kid is acting out, if they've, you know, suicidal ideation, if they're self harm, if they're experiencing homelessness, those things combined create an opportunity for exploitation. Mm -hmm. And so, um, A, it's the lack of awareness, a gap, I wouldn't say a lack of, I would say a gap of an awareness and training from providers. Law enforcement's the same way. Um, the first piece of trafficking, um, federal trafficking legislation was about 20 years ago. And so we've had 20 years of this educational movement um, to law enforcement and to just mainstream that's really, really catered to the trafficking of women. And so across the spectrum from law enforcement to providers to even parents, there's just this lack of awareness. And so that really um, perpetuates underreporting in addition to the societal, you know, the, the constructs around male victimization. One of the other challenges is that many young people who've been kicked out to the streets and who've, um, you know, that's their way of life and they've grown up on the streets, they don't see themselves as a victim. Um, and so, again, like I said before, we're not going to tell a young person that you're a victim. Um, what we will do is educate them, connect them to mentoring and stable supports and expose them to uh, more healthy behaviors. So then, again, at a point, they for themselves can say, wait, I'm being taken advantage of and, and I deserve better. So those three things are probably the, the, um, the, the biggest challenges to the underreporting. I will say that the United States is ranked the third highest in the entire world for reported cases of human trafficking. Florida is ranked the third highest in the United States for reported cases of human trafficking. And Broward County, as a direct result of active outreach, awareness, and training, we have actually been able to identify the most um, or encourage the most reports of potential of child trafficking in Broward County. Hmm. One of the, the biggest misconceptions that this is something that happens in Asia or this is not happening in my community. As a survivor, as an advocate, and as a, um, as a person who works with this population, I can assure you that there is not a school, a church, a community in Broward County that doesn't potentially have um, the opportunity for exploitation. Going back to those vulnerabilities, Stephen, homelessness, 
um, histories of child abuse, substance abuse, especially with the opioid epidemic. If we know that those things are on ramps to exploitation, if you have those vulnerabilities um, in your community, then there's a good chance that you have exploitation going on. Right. And I think one of the things you mentioned was there is a connection between substance abuse uh, and homelessness. Um, and can you maybe speak on how those things are just so intertwined uh, with human trafficking? Absolutely. So when we look at human trafficking, the one commonality with between sex and labor trafficking, between tra you know adult, domestic, foreign born, it's vulnerabilities. And we know that, so the, it might be helpful to, um, to give a definition of, of human trafficking. So okay. there's, a, there's a federal definition that I'll, I'll, I'll quote and then I'll kind of break it down for you. So we, the easy way to explain it is the AMP model, A-M-P. So it's the action by the means for the purpose. So the federal definition of human trafficking would be the inducement, the receipt, the harboring, the transport, transport the trading, that's the action by, by force, by fraud or coercion. So that's the means for the purpose of sexual slavery or exploitation or labor exploitation. And when you say national definition, like who, who defines that? That would be the federal, the federal legal definition, definition of human trafficking, which is modeled after, after the, the United Nations, the Palermo protocol right. and state law pretty much mir mirrors that. Okay. The one very important distinction there is that that um, element of the means, so the, the the force, the fraud, or the coercion for minors legally, that doesn't need to be present. So it's for a minor, it's any commercial sexual transaction with a minor. It would be legally identified as as as, as human trafficking, as child trafficking. Okay. So when we look at um, our young people, and we look at those vulnerabilities, we know that addiction and homelessness are the two most powerful tools that human traffickers use to manipulate and to coerce young people into engaging in, in, in survival sex, trafficking, or labor. And think about it, specifically to our LGBTQI youth. We know that um, our LGBTQI youth are disproportionately represented among our home homelessness population by as much as 40%. Um, we have studies that show that um, one in seven um, youth experiencing homelessness is potentially trafficked or lured for sex trafficking. So if our, our LGBTQI youth are disproportionately represented among that population, there will be higher instances of that. When it comes to, so when you're on the street um, here in Florida, like I said, from my story, every night on the street is a potential to be, to be sexually assaulted, victimized, raped, arrested, there's an opportunity for that because there's no, there's no protection. Um, it's cold. Sometimes it's rainy. Sometimes it's hot. We're hungry. So a, a young person experiencing homelessness has all of these vulnerabilities. Traffickers realize that and they will prey on that. They'll provide them with food. They'll say, Hey, do you need a place to stay for the night? Um, they'll initially establish this rapport, bring them into their, to their home. Hey, yeah, it's fine. And then they will just establish this rapport um, to then start the grooming process and then guilt them or force them or coerce them into engaging in, um, in sex work or survival sex. And remember, if that's a minor, if a, if, if a young person is having to trade sexual activities for a place to stay, it's anything of value. So it could be a place to stay. It could be drugs. It can be hormones. It can be toiletries. If a young person is having to trade sex for any of those things, that legally is, is sexual exploitation and trafficking. So homelessness this is the first. Um, there's a very clear nexus between addiction and, and human trafficking for three reasons. And let me, let me uh, lay those out for you. We know that young people will turn to drugs, as my story, as well as many other uh, uh, youth survivors, will, will turn to drugs to blot out and to numb themselves um, from the physical, the sexual, and the psychological abuse um, from the trafficking situation. Um, physically, opio opiates, um, heroin will numb the body from the physical rape. Um, emotionally and psychologically, alcohol, sub um, crystal meth, um, crack, marijuana, those will blot out and help a person, a kid detach. So there's one connection that um, young people are being, um, they're developing substance use disorders as a way to, to cope with trauma. 
A second uh, nexus or intersectionality is that we know that caregivers and parents who are abusing drugs or are hooked on drugs, um, unfortunately, will sell, trade, and pimp out their children for money um, and drugs. And we know this. Um, we know this to be a fact. Um, and the third piece is that we know that traffickers um, will approach young people that they know are struggling with substance use, provide them drugs, get them hooked again. And especially with our opiates or, or substances that are physically um, addictive, they will use that as then a coercive mechanism. And if you've ever experienced anyone um, recovering or battling with the heroin addiction or, or heroin addiction or opiates, um, it is grueling. It is excruciating withdrawal. And so that in and of itself is enough that these traffickers will use that intentionally to, um, to recruit young people. We know that in sober homes, um, children and youth and young adults are recruited by um, human traffickers and their recruiters right out of treatment centers, hmm. out of sober homes, out of group homes. So the, the, uh, the takeaway here is A, having an awareness of that if you're a service provider. If you are a service provider working in behavioral health or substance use and mental health disorder, if you're a service provider working with a young person who you know is struggling with addiction, that is a red flag. And we need to um, we need to wrap around that young person person with support. Um, and who are some of the service providers that you work with again? So here in Broward County, we have referrals have been um, our and, and our referral network is SunServe. We have reached out with Trans Inclusive Group for um, for assistance um, and guidance. The Department of Health, Renee Podolsky, um, and their programs for for trans empowerment. We have. Um, the Pride Center and their computer lab has provided resources um, for youth um, to go and look for jobs, or just as actually we have um, we have uh, utilized Pride Center space as a community center to actually interview victims when and when we first started. Um, the Flight Center is a, a close collaborator with ours. We're funded in part. A, pr a program of ours right now is funded by Children's Services Council. Um, the Nancy J. Cotterman Center, Banyan Health Systems, our housing provider or partner is Fellowship Living Facilities out in Margate, Florida. Mm -hmm. And depending on the need, legal aid, um, the um, Mama Curry's Closet, um, the Urban League, United Way, they've all um, at some point or at some level have provided letters of support and, um, and commitments to collaborating to prevent the exploitation of our young people. Okay, and those are all ones uh, maybe in the chat. Uh, after we get done, we can list some of those resources. Absolutely. Uh, and some of the links that if people are interested and need to reach out to them uh, individually, those are some things we can provide. Sure, uh, absolutely. <clears throat> and what are some of the initiatives right now you all are spearheading uh, to prevent this in our LGBTQA youth in our community? Sure, absolutely. So the, the first and foremost, we, we operate a, at, you know, at the individual level with empowering, we have specialized direct service programs for LGBTQI survivors. But let me start, it's, it's easier, I think, to digest um, from, you know, from a, a systemic uh, perspective, if we take it out to the macro level. Mm -hmm. So we've been funded, uh, or this, <clears throat> we've been funded by Children's Services Council to, um, for phase one of a collective impact initiative here in Broward County to galvanize or to spearhead the galvanization of a counter trafficking ecosystem. What that means is that we are bringing together and convening, training and developing the leaders of various systems across Broward County from justice to transitional, uh, transition to independent living, to behavioral health, the homeless continuum, uh, victim services, um, substance use um, and workforce development. We are collectively um, training and collective impact theory, conducting systems analyses across those systems to identify gaps in prevention and identification specifically for male, um, at-risk male, those identify as male, and as a separate population, our LGBTQI youth. Um, one example of that as an action item, just to, um, to give you an example, is the education system. So we partnered one Generation is the education working group that's um, been mobilized about three months ago. Mm -hmm. Members of that working group uh, oh. consist of uh, Broward Human Trafficking Coalition, Broward County School Board, Department of Children and Families, Guiding Light Outreach. We have uh, several, several providers. The first action item that um, we were successful, it was to be presented right when things got shut down because of COVID, but was a school board proclamation that 
um, we were able to get the school board to advocate for a prevention education curriculum in all middle schools across Broward County that was LGBTQI inclusive and gender conscious. What does that mean and why is it powerful? It means that um, forthcoming in the next 12 months, the action item would be a child, an evidence-based child exploitation prevention curriculum will be facilitated in middle and high schools all across Broward County that has specific case studies for trans youth, specific case studies for boys, for girls, that teaches them again what exploitation is in a way that they can understand, but also educates LGBTQI um, parents and providers all on that same curriculum on how to protect our children. Mm -hmm. So that's one example within one system. And we have actionable items again throughout the entire, uh, the entire spectrum um, from uh, advocating for a more trauma informed uh, children's court. Right now we have a girls court um, in Broward County, incredibly powerful and much needed, but boys and girls come from those same toxic families of origin. So we need an equitable uh, diversion program for our boys and specifically for young people that identify as LGBTQI. Mm -hmm. So at that macro level, to answer your question, we're transforming systems to um, increase their capacity to better or to, to prevent the trafficking of this population. Mm -hmm. At the individual level, we've created and we've partnered um, for a specific program prevention and direct care for LGBTQI survivors of human trafficking that present with substance use disorder. So what does that look like? We partnered with Fellowship Living. There is a, des a designated and supervised um, area of this um, transitional living facility where we provide the intervention and an advocacy. We partner with the Cotterman Center and with Banyan for case management. We provide care coordination. We uh, Fellowship provides the trauma res or the recovery coaching we provide mentoring and then we connect with trauma-informed job training and placement specifically for um, LGBTQI youth who have barriers to employment. Um, so that's just one example that of, of how, we're, um, how we're mobilizing. The final piece of that, Stephen, is specifically with disaster response. Mm -hmm. So we are partnering, we actually have a meeting with the with Children's Services Council and the STARS Committee and other providers to, um, to, to mobilize a human trafficking specific COVID response. COVID-19 is, um, is causing havoc across the world. There's mass loss of jobs, um, poverty, um, families are now waiting in, um, in, you know, in food kitchens, <clears throat> people are becoming homeless, um, they're, they're struggling with food insecurity. Specific to LGBTQI young people and how that affects or how COVID is affecting them, <clears throat> We know that those vulnerabilities that we've said we've talked about earlier are isolation, lack of access to services, discrimination, and poverty. So, at-risk LGBTQI youth are already kind of in a vulnerable position with the uh, stay-at-home orders and the cancellation of in-person 12-step meetings, in-person uh, work with a sponsor, in-person mental health counseling, in-person intervention. Those our LGBTQI young people who were vul already vulnerable, that's been compounded. Mm -hmm. With the lack of jobs, there's an increase in, um, in unemployment and financial insecurity. So families who, uh, families of LGBTQI youth or LGBTQI young people who are who were already struggling with financial insecurity are even more at risk. Mm -hmm. that, um, that, that financial insecurity is a push factor um, so traffickers are now uh, approaching this population, knowing that they're at greater risk and, and starting the grooming process. Another part of that, Stephen, is that we know that our sex worker community, um, their, their clientele and those engaging in survival sex, their clientele has been drastically reduced because of all of this. And so taking away someone's client or their whatever in whatever context that you want to you choose their pimp their client their 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 trick that doesn't take away the hunger taking away that person doesn't take away the the opioid the opiate withdrawal taking away that um, that person doesn't provide hormones so all that does is it it forces these young people to resort to riskier behaviors and further into the underground economy which can provide can be very dangerous. Mm -hmm. So we're involved in 
um, and the mobilization of a specific response, a COVID response specific to this population that includes increased uh, training to all providers specifically around this, this subject and assertive street outreach to educate our young people. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's so much of increased anxiety. There's so much of increased need um, as a result of the COVID-19 crisis that's going on. People are, there's so many more people that will be homeless. There are so many more people that will um, be in need. I think this, uh, as you said, this will be so, so much uh, severe crisis uh, going on. Um, and the overlap of services and the tying together of services, I think is even more critical than it, it was, was before. before. Um, so so I'm, I'm glad to hear even more about what you all are providing. Absolutely. I think that if there's a challenge that we've we've identified from a national response is that I don't believe I think we many of us agree that we, we didn't we weren't we weren't as far out ahead of this pandemic as we could have. And so, you know, building on those lessons here in Broward County at a local response, we need to partner. This is a time for service providers to you know to really focus on, on principles over personalities, really embrace collaboration. And, and come together to stay mm -hmm. as far out ahead as this, of this pandemic and go as far upstream as we can, um, uh, communicating the connections, the intersectionality between, mm -hmm. um, between this pandemic and other um, epidemics and forms of violence. Um, we know, as you said, there's gonna be an increase in homelessness, food insecurity, relapse from addiction. Um, we firmly believe and we advocate for providers coming together and funders coming together to, to fund um, additional uh, programming um, for, for, you know, to empower young people, especially LGBTQI youth experiencing homelessness and, and substance use challenge, because we know because of this, there will be unfortunately um, increases in those, in those vulnerabilities. Yeah, well, one of the things I've learned in, in talking to everyone is that the connections need to be made even more so, um, that everyone is aware of all the services that are available, um, whether it's bars, clubs, entertainment, um, outreach services, whatever it is, the funding services. Um, we've talked with our fund, we've talked with our County County Cultural Division, Division, we've talked with a, new, a number of people who are providing both services and funding and resources and advice is that everyone, everyone needs, needs to be aware, aware even more so of what uh, all services are available. One, so they can refer each other, and two, so they can build on each other. Um, and so there's not quite uh, a redundancy of services when there doesn't need to be, but, but at the same, same time, time, people can, can refer, refer each other when, when uh, it's needed, it's needed um, and really um, help, really each, help other each other out. out. Um, there's, um, there's, we have, we have such, such a huge, huge but tight in LGBT, LGBT community, community here that live here. here. Um, this, um, is this is a huge, huge obviously, obviously, you know, uh, LGBT, uh, LGBTQ travel destination. Um, I believe it still will be after all of this is done and um, the needs that are here are so great. Um, yeah. what, are, what are some volunteer opportunities right now that um, uh, you guys would have? Absolutely, thank you for that. Um, we're, we're, a, we're, a, we're a resilient community. Um, we, and we know that, so we'll overcome. Right now, it's how we respond, and this is how we'll be measured: is how we respond right now. And it's 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 collaborate, it's collaboration. Um, opportunities we have at the at the um, response level for service providers and other organizations. Um, our email is available. We will be sending out um, emails. We have several working groups being scheduled over the next three weeks specifically for LGBTQ service providers to come together. So the volunteer opportunities would be to join working groups and the strategic planning group. There's no cost. Um, the training of and collective impact to galvanize these providers to specifically train them on the nexus between human trafficking and COVID and LGBTQ has been funded by Children's Services Council. So volunteer opportunities would be joining those. Um, we have opportunities for assertive street outreach. So if you are a person with experience working with hard, um, at reach, uh, average populations, a public health worker, we have um, a coordinated outreach uh, program um, that meets, that we um, assertively go out to engage with these populations. Mm -hmm. If you are a person with experience working with, with, um, with young people, whether that's as an advocate, as a teacher, as a service provider, we um, we coordinate the facilitate or the certification of those prevention education facilitators. 
um, that I was speaking of. Um, they are there's 20 people in each class. You send us um, you send us a, a, an invite. There's no cost to you except for fifty dollars, um, and we uh, we provide the certification or according to the certification for you to go into schools and into your organizations and into communities to provide prevention education. We also have uh, volunteer opportunities for um, people you know that, that may find themselves at home with some extra time to do. Um, assembling sur uh, street survival kits. These are basic essential items that we um, that we would distribute to to at risk youth populations, but also care packages um, to to survivors in care. And that could be just a box with you know fresh underwear, um, you know some socks, letters of support, some food items, pop tarts, anything that you would you know made send off to your kid at college or mm -hmm. or, or someone in the community. Um, two special events planning. So we um, we have two signature events. Events resilience awards are our gala. It's a luncheon on December first, uh, December first, Giving Tuesday. It's a tribute to American heroes due due to uh, the COVID. And so if you have um, an interest or experience in planning events, um, we're forming the planning team there. The proceeds specifically from, from resilience awards specifically benefit the Matthew C. White Resilience Fund. Uh, Matthew C. White mm -hmm. Resilience Fund is an agency designated fund housed within our fund foundation. Those okay. funds are specifically earmarked to provide trauma resolution to LGBTQI plus survivors of human trafficking. Mm -hmm. um, we have a link on our website and on Facebook and you can contact uh, Mark Blaylock or David over at, at our fund for the specific link to that. And finally, we have uh, Night on the Streets, Ending the Trafficking of Homeless Youth is our collaborative event taking place March uh, March 20th of 2021. We're in the planning stage now. That's a collaborative and really fun, innovative way um, to educate families and communities around human trafficking through through arts and music. So it is a arts, music, and food truck festival that takes place downtown Fort Lauderdale. There's a sleep out event from 12 a.m. to 6 a.m. where we literally sleep outside in, in Mass District where we did last year in solidarity. Um, we partnered with Fort Lauderdale Police, and, and we had we had a, a good group of people do that last year. Finally, the the third part of that is the Resilience Youth Fair. So while okay. we're concurrently raising awareness of families and communities, uh, faith leaders, LGBTQ leaders through this festival, educating them through the arts and sleeping out to raise money for our programming, there is a simultaneous uh, resource fair, a health and resource fair specifically designed for at-risk youth um, experiencing homelessness, substance use challenges, and other uh, other vulnerabilities. It targets 15 to 24 years old, and that's collaborative. So we have letters of support from that from United Way uh, Flight Center. Um, uh, our fund was, is, was supporting that. Many service providers are collaborating. They send service providers to um, do these health and wellness trainings and <coughs> the young people. So there were three elements of that event where we are taking on volunteers now for planning, um, for logistics, for the for the resource fair part. So we have many opportunities from direct service to strategic planning, to board opportunities to, to these actual community mobilization events. Okay. Um, the best way to find out about that is to visit our website or you can email me directly um, and I can give you, you know, I can send you a, a one pager on, on all those many opportunities. Sure. Um, we can include that in the chat log. If you have that open right now, uh, you can, uh, if you want to type that in, um, you can go ahead and type that in if you want. Um, but uh, yeah, you can do that. So. <laughs> um, well, we can do it after the video if you'd like. Okay. Um, yeah, sure. I can show you where it is. But okay. yeah, it sounds like you have some uh, some already great things planned. I think I know things will come back to life and things will come back to normal, and everyone is planning their events and activities. And at some point, people will be ready to get out of the house and um, sure. ha have some semblance to normalcy of life and. Um, so I appreciate the, the good work that you all are doing. Um, there's quite a breadth and depth of services that you all are providing. And it, it sounds like bringing together the network of services for a lot of people and then educating our community on the human, human trafficking. Absolutely. There's one, <clears throat> there one a really important um, kind of takeaway, Stephen, if I can. Um, we, I, would, I would recommend if you're a caregiver, a parent, or a service provider, <clears throat> there's a specific link on Facebook, uh, uh, the sign up. On May 5th, we have a series, we're partnering to provide live stream um, education, no cost education and awareness, specifically mm -hmm. there's three. Uh, one is specifically um, geared towards, towards young people. Um, it's a two hour um, presentation. Um, there's a second component of that specifically for parents and, and caregivers of LGBTQ 
to bypass youth, and, and a third component for um, for service providers. Um, we're live streaming this in partnership with uh, with some of, several of our partners on May fifth, and I would highly suggest anyone, uh, any of your viewers or um, any of our community members, this is a no cost way to really empower and fortify not only your family, uh, maybe your children and your youth, your programs, but also our community as a, uh, as a collective. Okay. Uh, we did have one question about uh, fentanyl uh, as a drug overdose. Have you seen that? Have you seen that a lot? It's been in the news. Fentanyl as a drug overdose? Uh huh. No. No. Uh, it just has been. It's a. Uh, I looked it up. High risk for addiction and dependence. Uh, for uh, a, it's a pain medication. It was just a question we had. No, but we have fentanyl. Oh, fentanyl. No, fentanyl. fentanyl. I thought you said fentanyl. Fentanyl. Oh, fentanyl absolutely. Sorry. No, fentanyl, absolutely. And we've seen it, we've seen it laced in everything. We've seen it now laced in marijuana and four loco um and with, with other with other narcotic and opiates. Um and it and it's and it's dangerous. So we've we've unfortunately um with with these young people who've experienced this level of trauma, Stephen, mm -hmm. um, it's not about smoking a joint. It's about doing whatever and the hardest core drug I can to numb such severe and one of the most heinous crimes known to mankind. Mm. And so what happens is these young people, even though they know the risk, if they're not, if they're not connected with culturally relevant um, trauma informed victim centered counseling and therapy, the alternative without access to those services even is many times overdose and murder mm. and suicide. There's a very clear connection before I, we do have, um, I have two numbers I could, um, I'd like to give everyone and then we could put it in the chat center. If you, sure. if, if you, um, believe that you or think, you know, of someone or a child or an adult, um, being victimized, or if you even have a thought, um, I would suggest everyone calling the national human trafficking hotline. Um, you can put this in your phone. I'm going to give you the number now. It is one eight, 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 37, 37. 888. Okay. So that's 1-888-3737-888. 8 that is a national hotline. And so if you are a person here that maybe you've been victimized yourself or you're a member of the community and you're afraid, you know, it's a tight-knit community and I don't want to cause any trouble, this is a national hotline, extremely confidential, and they are anywhere near you. So your confidentiality will be protected. The second part of that is a text. So if you're a young person watching um, and you think you might have been victimized, or if you're in a situation right now, um, if you're in immediate trouble, I would call 911. If that's not going to be safe for you, call the hotline. I can give you a text number as well. You would text be free. You would text help, H E L P, to be free, which is 233 733. And we can provide those contact information uh, or those contact numbers with you, Stephen. Okay. I just put, uh, I found that on uh, on the online, found their website, and I just put that website uh, in the chat log. And those two numbers that you mentioned uh, are on their website. So people can find that information on there as well. Um, and then how do we, how do we find um, you uh, on your social media and your, um, your information as well for uh, Arca Freedom Alliance? Sure. So on Facebook, we have, um, there's, there's two sites. There's a night on the streets site. If you're look, interested in, in following up on that or um, volunteering, we also have Arca Freedom Alliance US is our Facebook address. Okay. On LinkedIn for more organizational and corporate matters for training and capacity building, um, it's on LinkedIn. It's Arc of Freedom Alliance. Okay. Instagram is Arc of Freedom Alliance or AOF Alliance. Okay. Our, our website is www.aofalliance.org. And then my email, um, if you're interested in a free training, awareness, help, assistance, um, is my first name dot last name AOF Alliance dot org. So it's Nathan dot Earl at AOF is in freedom Alliance dot org. All right. And I put all of that just now in the chat log so people see that as well, Nathan. So they've got the uh, your website, AOF Alliance dot org, and then they've got your email in there as well. So Excellent. Thank, you. thank you. This has been very interesting and very educational. I think it's uh, a broader scope topic than most people realize or understand, um, but you've done a very excellent job educating us 
uh, on it. And um, is there anything else you'd like to add or, or that we haven't touched on? We've, I wanted to definitely get those, those intervention numbers out there. Um, though if there was one takeaway um, that every, I would like everyone to know is that human trafficking is an epidemic. It's a form of violence that's happening right here in Broward County. Um, it's happening with significance. Um, we have an opportunity to, um, to, to, uh, to take action. This, the, the trafficking of a child is, is, is very hard to digest, right? Um, we don't want to think about it. Um, now that you know, we really don't have a choice. There are, there are agencies here and collaboration, the Broward Human Trafficking Coalition, as well as Arca Freedom Alliance, um, who are mobilizing and have opportunities for every member of the community to take action again as against one of the, the most heinous crimes known to mankind but i would like to say as evidence of this phone call i experienced all of those horrible things as a, as a kid i experienced trafficking and all of those consequences um, if you're a person who's in the life if you are a recent victim or identified victim or a survivor um, today i not only have the pleasure of working with young people empowering communities like this i also work as a consultant with the office for victims of crime for the united states i consult with the national center for missing and exploited children and i advise organizations across the country on what this looks like if that's not evidence of the resilience of the human spirit when young people are connected with a trauma-informed community i don't know what is Mm -hmm. um, if you're a young person and you're coming up and you're getting out of the life, you can do this. You're going to have to work your ass off on it, but you can do it. Um, please reach out to me or our organization or these other providers, and we are more than happy to wrap around you and support you every step of the way um, to you get to a point where you believe for yourself that you can do anything in the world um, in spite of whatever challenges um, that, that may be against you. Thank you, Stephen, for your time. Thank really you. appreciate your valuable opportunity. I usually wrap up by, I, you actually answered my last question. Um, I usually wrap up by saying, what words of encouragement can you offer our viewers? And I think you actually just answered that uh, ahead of me. Um, is that no matter what, what you're going through, um, you can get through it. There are resources available. Um, it may be work, but you can get through it and you can come out better on the other side. Uh, I would say I would say that about the pandemic that we are going through. It can make us better people. It does not have to break us. Absolutely. Um, and there are resources out there and the human spirit will provide. And I've said the same thing. Um, our tagline right now is that the concerts may have stopped, but the music will not be silenced. And I believe that in what we are doing and what everyone is doing. So, Nathan, thank you for your time today. This has been most excellent. And I look forward to some future updates from sure. you and some future videos um and some writings and connecting with you further so thank you so much for the opportunity you're doing great work Stephen. as well appreciate it th thank you and uh everyone stay safe have a great afternoon